Learning to garden can be fun for kids. Mix in some reading and snacks and it makes for a pretty awesome educational experience. Tonight we take you to a children's literature garden at the Duluth home of a retired teacher on this edition of Great Gardening Straight Ahead. Every tree has a moment when it shines. That's called money wart or creeping jenny. You can go in and do a rejuvenating pruning. Forage and feed for our native pollinator population. A garden really gives you peace of mind. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. Ready to get outside and get those hands dirty? Well, so are our expert panelists who are here to help make the garden season more successful. They are Tom Casper, local garden professional, and Bob Olin, an area horticulturist and educator. Hey, it's finally starting to feel like garden season out there. I like that hey. Finally. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we it said this once before on this program. Or is it program. straw? <laughs> yeah. Is straw uh, better? <laughs> yeah. Well, it certainly has, be has been beautiful the last yeah. couple of days, and they're talking about the weekend. Uh, a little more warmth and stuff should really be coming up. Indeed, gardeners should be excited about that. Well, we do have some gardeners who are phone volunteers, the St. Louis County Master Gardeners. They do such a great job and all you have to do is call them with your questions and they will pass them along to us for an immediate response. What a deal that is. Dial the numbers there on the screen or email us at askgardening at wdsc.org. Well, it's, you know, we've all been waiting so long, and <laughs> now it's beautiful out there, but what can we really do at this point in the garden? Well, we all really kind of want to jump the season. We have waited a long time, and actually we're entitled to some good weather now. Mm -hmm. But we want to be just a little careful. A lot of snow melt, a lot of moisture in the ground. We didn't have a lot of frost, so you really want to stay off a lot of those areas, particularly anything that's tilled. You don't, you want to avoid compaction, really. So. If you got to get out there, I would say uh, take a nice broom rake. Don't take a garden rake on the lawn and just pick up a little bit of the debris. Sure. Probably just a little bit early again, even if you're overseeding. Uh, let's let things dry down a little bit. Let's let the uh, soil temperatures come up a little bit mellow. So we're probably maybe a week or so away from when we're going to get pretty serious about this. And, and, and certainly uh, very good points there. And the other thing to think about is as we want to get out and get into the garden as those new those shoots are emerging for those perennials or things that we have growing in our garden nothing worse than a foot on top of those when they're oh, getting started yeah. so so stay out of the garden uh -huh. enjoy it from the edge not much compaction in your lawn or those areas and just enjoy it. Maybe a little pruning if you can get it in. So. And, and what about the deer? Should we be protecting those emerging shoots Absolutely. already? Absolutely. Yeah. They're already out. Mm -hmm. um, I've already seen tulip damage of the, the brand new emerging Darn tip, them. so it's already time to start doing deer protection. Even okay. things like uh, rhubarb that mm -hmm. they traditionally don't like, but these emerging shoots are vulnerable. Yeah. Okay. Good. And they got to eat too, I guess. The deer. Yeah, the deer got to eat. <laughs> they had a long winter. Do they have to eat those pretty flowers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, here's a cool story about a teacher who discovered gardening in retirement and found a way to incorporate that activity with early learning for neighborhood children, including her grandkids. Anybody want to give some raspberries some water? Natalie, you know where they are. Okay. My name is Ethel Nelson and we moved to Duluth about two years ago. We moved up here to be closer to our children and grandchildren. And along the way, we discovered a hobby that we had never had before. We started gardening with the grandchildren. And so this all kind of started with them being interested in the backyard, teaching science and teaching um, everything about growing plants was all part of my background, although it was done in a classroom. But I felt it was really important to tie literature to it because any lesson that I taught at school always started with a book. My favorite book in kindergarten was a book called Jamberry, and we could incorporate so many uh, ways to eat food and eat the berries and play games with them. And so that was the first, first story we did. We have three different kinds of berries growing, and so we wanted to do raspberries, blueberries, and strawberries. The kids have watered, and the kids can just go down and turn the spigot and 
fill their little cans up with water and they water the garden. They can overwater it, it drains really well and uh, it, it's just great fun for them. And they count the number of cans of water that it takes. So there's just a lot of learning that goes on, math in the garden. And grow into plants. Squash bl blossom, there's some of those in the garden today. There it is, that's basil. I cut it up in little ribbons. It's green. And I have a really nice vegetable dip. Isn't it good to have soup when it's cold? Yeah. That's a new book. It's called Chicks and Salsa. And so I had to have a salsa garden. So we knew we had to have tomatoes and we knew we had to have cilantro. We have lots of cilantro. The fun thing is, is the children know after reading the book, all of the different items that are in salsa, the recipe is in the book. They knew the names of all these plants by the time we were done with the book. Then we had salsa to eat for our snack and salsa chips, and um, that was great fun. The idea I also the eat what grows in your area. This year, being out here, we have met so many people walking by, want to know what we're doing. Uh, we've met lots of neighborhood children, and actually we took a little field trip down to their house when we read the Chicks and Salsa book because they have chickens in their backyard. It's really exciting to see people in urban areas do things that are not normally done in urban areas. Well, it's fun, very fun for us. Have kids wave to us and, and know who your neighbors are. What a great way to get to know your neighbors yeah, and absolutely. bring them into, uh, bring them together and you know, be part of that community. Well, who can be gardening and snacks? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bigger than the carrots yeah. and snap peas. Yeah, that's right. right. A and little ranch dressing in house. The kids really did know their veggies. That yeah, they could walk around story. and, yeah, yeah, Beautiful. Yeah. He's a, does a very nice job. Yes, they did. They did a great job. I love the, I love the way they, you know, built that garden and were able to put so many things in a, such a small space. Yeah. Okay, time for some questions. We have one from Karen, who is looking for a low maintenance ground cover. She has a rocky area with direct sun till 4.30 and then shade. And then uh, it is clay and wet in the spring. A um, couple choices she can think about. A juga, which is a easy to care for perennial. Doesn't bloom all summer, but you can get some of them that have different colors, foliage. They bloom with a bright lavenderish uh, blue flower in the mm -hmm. spring. Uh, tolerates just about any soil condition and certainly will do well in the sun like that. So, And you know, possibly, and uh, I know people aren't going to like to hear this, but she said heavy clay is wet. Uh, consider some mosses in there. Oh, sure. You know, really, mm -hmm. a lot of people want to limit them. They can be beautiful, really, and in mm -hmm. that kind of setting, they'll grow nicely for her. Right. Okay, great. Um, oh, a follow-up question was, does zoysia grass survive here? Again, that's barely in zone four. It's kind of a trick question because uh. zoysia survives like a lot of, lot of plants survive during the summer, mm -hmm. but it'll go down immediately in the fall. Okay. It's a type of grass that will only grow in the south. It's akin to a Bermuda grass. Everybody really wants to grow our common Kentucky bluegrass, but they mm -hmm. can't. So we should stick to what we're good at, and that's common Kentucky blue in the sun at least. Okay, question from Pam in Duluth, who has a blue spruce that developed a blight last fall with pink on the tips of the top branches. It's four feet tall. Can it be saved? You know, this is one, and the, the trigger there was pink, and we, should, we can learn a few things. Colorado blues are vulnerable to a number of fungal diseases. This one is uh, Cercoccus because of that pinkish color, and um, it will eventually claim that blue spruce. But if she wants to very carefully prune out on those growing tips, you can't take too much off because that's where the new growth is going to come from. But you can very carefully remove some of that disease material, get it off the property. Mm -hmm. And then there are some fungicides that will slow the spread. But that's a very challenging disease for Colorado blue spruce. Okay. And, and really what she might want to do on a, for other listeners that are thinking about uh, planting evergreens or things like that, really stay away from the Colorado blue spruce. They have so many issues in our region now and seems to be yeah. more and more issues. So there are better... <coughs> excuse me, better spruce trees that she can try, like the, like the Black Hill spruce, or which is a 
derivative of a white spruce and things like that. Or okay. it's great tips or Norway. Or you know, Norway isn't a native, but it really is, is rocks off beautiful pendulous tree that we kind of overlook. Norway black and white spruce, much better up for the long haul than Colorado blues. Okay. Sue from Saginaw has a blue moon wisteria. It has never bloomed. She's had it for 10 years and is wondering about when it should be pruned. Um, really, right now is the time to prune it and not drastic pruning, but take off all of the, what you want to do is take it down to the main trunk or the main uh, stems of that vine, get it back. Uh, it should be sprouting here in a few weeks and she'll want to fertilize that with a higher phosphorus and potassium type fertilizer. Stay away from heavy nitrogen for it or else she'll force a lot of growth and no blooms and good luck. Good suggestions. We all need a little good luck yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> but right now we're getting questions about pruning apple. A little late for apples, a little late for uh, prunus, that would be cherries and plums, and a little late for your mountain ash. Anything that's vulnerable to uh, uh, some of the fire blight fungi, we really want to stay away from. Too late, we'll have to wait till next winter. Okay. Can't wait, huh? That reminded me that I had a question from Sue in Foxborough who planted a red select cherries that were have a black fungus along the branches. And how does she get rid of that? And is the fruit still edible? Uh, probably black knot, very susceptible to that. And, and really in our environment and all around us, what she can do if she wants to remove it is cut about a foot down from that blackish growth and prune her or uh, sterilize her pruner between cuts so she's not spreading it throughout that plant and really hope for uh, a prolonged period of being able to enjoy that by doing some of those things. But inevitably, it's probably gonna be taken by the fungus. And in answer to the question, she can eat all those cherries, she can grow. The challenge is gonna be to grow them with that much oh. black, <laughs> black knot on there. All right, uh, Nancy from Morgan Park has an ornamental crab that's mostly dead, 30 years old, wants to replace it. What fruit tree would be self-pollinating and should the old stump come out? Well, you know, she's talking about, I don't know if she wants an ornamental again, if she wants to replace it. We've got a lot of good ornamentals and the climate is gradually warming on us and that's opening up a lot of zone four materials throughout the area. So there are some real nice new ornamentals that have resistance to some of these diseases that might have actually taken this. So, yeah. you know, and you can always go back to the basics, Radiant, Red Splendor, Prairie Fire. We've got a number of very, very good ones. Um, others, uh, you know, all in that uh, edible apple are all gonna be vulnerable to some of these diseases. But we've got a lot of real good winter hardy apples out there now as well. And if it's the Nancy I know in Morgan Park, she's a heck of a gardener. Oh, she okay. is. Yeah. We'll have to go see her garden. We'll go see her garden. Okay. <laughs> of course, there's only one Nancy there's in Morgan Park. There's only one Nancy in Morgan, <laughs> Morgan Park that's watching this show right at this moment. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, there's an Arlene in Duluth who wants to know when to plant grass seed this spring. It's a good question. I think I would wait just a little bit. Again, we talked about avoiding the compaction. It's very, very moist. Uh, you've got plenty of season left. Let's look at about uh, May 1st and let's spend a little time preparing that seed bed. Um, you know, you want to have a real light, open, dryish soil. Get your seed down, get it compressed or compact into the soil, cover with something to retain the moisture and uh, she's good to go. I would say a couple of weeks and then that's about ideal. Yeah, really she wants us soil temperatures to be up probably in the, at least the low 50s before okay. she's starting to do seeding, so. All right, Wes from ESCO, who loves the show. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Wes. Uh, wants to know if he can uncover strawberries yet or is it too early? Well, I, I really think that you wanna take a little look and if those plants really wanna go, you wanna at least open them up. One of the nice things about being a home gardener is that you can open them up if we have the, th if we have the th threat of frost. The biggest risk for a home gardener is the buds break, so now you've got flowers. And the flowers are gonna be very vulnerable to frost and you freeze them off or you damage them and your fruit crop is spoiled. So um, open them up a little bit, give them a little air, but uh, we obviously are, have got a long ways to go before we're completely frost free. Yeah, and really Wes, said, to paraphrase that, you can move the mulch, but leave it nearby. Yeah, <laughs> get ready. You might have to cover them back up. <laughs> you it again. And actually, Keep that straw <laughs> close. This, in a pile. Yeah. I was just going to say this is the reason a commercial person really needs overhead irrigation. They obviously can be taking off straw, putting it on, so mm -hmm. they will pull it off, but they're set to go to protect those flower buds with overhead irrigation. Okay. Uh, Frankie from Duluth wants to know when to prune my shrub roses. Really now is a great time to do that, mm -hmm. and really shrub roses are pretty, they can respond to just about any time of the year pruning, but uh, 
before they're breaking bud if he wants to go out and he can take them right down to the ground or just take off the tips, whatever, they will respond very well to pruning. So great time to do it right now. Okay, let's take one more question for this round. Basil, I've had, it says basil plants, no luck. Lives on the North Shore. Uh, this is from Serene. Warm season crop is the yep. big, big thing, and yeah. uh, that's one thing that you want to grow in your kitchen, keep in your kitchen, because it's not going to be happy if you set it out now. I'd say keep trying, but he might want to delay, because you don't have to get them real large. If yeah. you'd plant maybe June 10th, June 15th, you should be able to get a nice crop even along the shore. Yeah, and, and certainly if they're living on the North Shore, maybe put in uh, those basal, plant, basal plants in a protected area of their right. home on the, on the west side away from the lake, if that's possible, or somewhere protected from the cold of Lake Superior, even in June and July. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we don't just get questions. We get pictures of the successes seen in gardens across the region. Here are a few we're happy to share in this week's Grow and Show. Deborah Nichols of Cromwell is on the lookout for the return of her beautiful purple iris. Other selections from her gardens include hostas mixed with perennial greens and blooms like this vibrant lily. Deborah says this time of year she envisions the beauty beneath the soil as she waits for blooms to return. Her granddaughter Allie is also anxious to get to work on the fairy gardens they create together. Zabel Stodola of Duluth says she snapped several photos of this monarch butterfly alight on her sedum late last summer before getting the shot of it with wings fully extended. And Don and Nancy Larson of Washburn, Wisconsin had great success last spring with bulbs and blooms in both this central rectangular plot and this nearby bed of daffodils and tulips. The begonias and impatiens are bright and happy alongside the gate. Rudbeckia trumpet their summertime arrival at the Larsons, as do the sunny yellow lilies. Garden season seems to be a favorite time for Scuffy as well. Do you have photos of plants and flowers you'd like to share with Great Gardening? Don't hesitate to send them in to greatgardening at wdsc.org or mail to the address on your screen and let us show what you grow. All right, keep those pictures coming in. Uh, we love to see them and of course that was all from last season but things are going to get beautiful again very soon. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, yeah. it is. Okay, let's get to more questions um, from Gail in Hawthorne. She's growing wild blackberries with tame raspberries. Uh, will they be at risk for disease? You know, I don't really think so. First, congratulations on growing the blackberries, which are a challenge for us, at least on the North Shore. And um, I would say the big risk is going to be this Drosophila, spotted wing Drosophila fly. That's going to be an insect problem as opposed to a disease issue. They always have some, but not something that's going to, ki going to kill the plant. Okay. All right. Um, we have a couple of apple tree questions. Let's see. Sandy on, in Fish Lake has an apple tree that died a couple of years ago from girdling. Mm. Um, it has three to four feet high shoots coming from the ground. Can those be grafted? And if yes, when? Well, uh, more than likely that shoot is the rootstock that survived uh, and is generally not the species of tree that she purchased. So if she wants to save it, it's gonna redevelop and grow but it's not gonna be what she, what she lost um, due to girdling. Um, and it really brings up a good point for us as gardeners to make sure when we plant those uh, trees and, and things that we spend a lot of money on mm -hmm. in our garden that we do things to protect them, whether it's uh, mulch rings around the tree or protection in the winter time from rodents or sun scald. So um, it's a good lesson for her, unfortunately, but probably best for her to replace that and try to get what she initially wanted to grow. I agree, because here she's, it's never going to make good rootstock for her because she's taking the upper portion of the cyan, obviously no roots there. So really, and it's a crab apple, which may not be a good species, but it grows. But I agree, I think it's time to just uh, prune at ground level and time to plant again, right? That's right. <laughs> prune at ground prune level. Prune at ground level. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's another one um, from Hazel, who has beacon apple trees that are two years old, and she planted the seeds in, that she had in the refrigerator 
as advised on this program a and few years worked. ago. Uh, those plants are around three feet high, plus some shorter ones, and now she has honey crisp apple plants that just got growing. So she's wondering, do I have to graft them with another apple tree, and if so, how do I do that? Uh, and she can kind of refer back to the previous question, okay. really, in reverse. Um, in this case, it doesn't have, they don't have rootstocks that are more than likely going to survive in our, in our cold, unless we, our environment is changing as, uh, as drastically as some say. They may eventually, but as of right <laughs> mm -hmm. now, they're not. So um, she may want to look into grafting those onto a rootstock, and there's certainly classes out there that can help folks with that. So. And she has to remember, anything that she took from seed, the genetics is reverted now. So she's not necessarily guaranteed she's going to get that same tree. So that beacon that came from seed is not a beacon. It's something mm -hmm. else. Okay. <laughs> so let us know how that does. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> she may be onto something. She yeah. may be onto something. Then we'll come and graft it for her. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Judy has a question about a wall of shrub roses that she wants to get bigger. So what kind of pruning should be done to keep them healthy and vibrant? Well, uh, Judy, uh, you know, certainly the Glen or Graceland Gardens area that Judy is a gardener in, um, yeah. she can take those right down. And, and now again, similar to our previous question, now's a great time to do that. And you can take them down to three or four inches from the ground and they're gonna sprout back up probably two to three feet of growth this year, depending on the variety and still bloom for her this year. So good rejuvenating pruning. We're really thickening it up and be good for the plants. So. Excellent. And she wants a big shrub, so let's get a little nitrogen fertilizer right as those buds are beginning to break and get, you're seeing the regrowth. Don't put it on now or when you prune, but when you see the regrowth. Okay. Uh, I think this is Sabad from Duluth, has an eight foot Norway maple with black powdery substance on the upper two feet of the trunk. Um, what can he do? What is it? It's a fungus, obviously, mm -hmm. but th uh, these fungi that are on the outside of the bark, uh, most typically they're not real aggressive fungi. Mm -hmm. So I would say live with it. Again, you know, oftentimes on the north side where there's just a little bit more moisture, uh, I wouldn't be too aggressive scraping it off because that bark is a protective layer. I would probably just let it go and I don't think it's gonna cause any problems. And, and again, Norway maple, uh, one of those sort of borderline trees mm -hmm. that seem to do well and then we'll get one of those difficult winters. So protecting that trunk in the wintertime at least up to those first branches will also help prolong the life of that. So. All right, let's see if we can get through the last of these. Doreen from rural Duluth area. Do you have any tips for starting strawberry plants from seeds? Ooh, there's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, no. <laughs> Uh, Good one because it's <clears throat> difficult. <laughs> yeah, obviously okay. they can be started from seed, but it's like a it's like a number of things that we've all tried to start from seed. Uh, you may s try it once, and then you may never do it again if you're successful. <laughs> obviously they're crossed, and that's where we get the new varieties. Uh, you're much better off starting from the plants. If he wants to try it, of course, he's got to wait until uh, you know the, the flowers are mature and get the crossing the pollen crossed and try to. Uh, get the fruit to develop and then save and dry out the uh, the seeds from the fruit. Can be done, a little bit of a challenge. Okay, Tom from Washburn wants to know what variety of raspberry would you recommend? Well, Boyne has been around a long time. Mm -hmm. Latham, uh, Killarney is a favorite of mine. So those are three that I like if you're gonna grow raspberries, but certainly we've been talking for the last year or so about the, the Drosophila fly and the challenges right. that are coming in with that. So they're may want to look at growing other things. Okay. Um, Nancy from Babbitt got seeds from a lupin last year and wants to know when to plant them. Okay, once again, she needs to cold stratify, the same technique we used with the, with the apple. She wants those, if she collected in the fall and she's had them in a warm, uh, heated house, she wants to get them in damp sand in the refrigerator for at least another 60 days. And that breaks the, that stratifies, cold stratifies it, breaks it, allows them to germinate, and then she can seed them in a good seeding mix first and then transplanting them out. And if she's done that, she can do it, she can see them right now. Okay, great. Nancy, for, good luck with that. That sounds like a little bit of a process, but they're beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nancy from Pike Lake asks, what shrub roses would be good for our area? Well, there's literally hundreds and yeah, hundreds of shrub roses and going out and finding those. Um, uh, if she's looking for a climbing shrub rose, William Baffin is probably the best one. Brilliant uh, reddish pink, color. I wore the shirt. Like the shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, William go. Booth <laughs> is actually, this color is an outstanding shrub uh -huh. rose as well. There's lots of the, look for the varieties that are coming out of the Morden Research uh, Station out of Canada. Very, very hardy and do well for us without a lot of input. So. Okay, and wonderful. If I, 
could mention uh, Kate Algren, who's a Rosarian, consulting a Rosarian. We've been to her place, beautiful roses. She's moved roses. almost entirely to the shrub roses yeah. for lots mm -hmm. of good reasons. She'll be speaking this Saturday at the Extravaganza. Oh, okay. These well, are one of the low care, um, sustainable perennials okay. you can get your landscape. Excellent. She's the expert locally. Okay, I just, this, one is, this one is interesting <laughs> to me, and I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can give me a yes or no. Uh, Ron from Brimson found seed in an old building that was being demolished from 1917, 1918. Will the seed still germinate? It's the kind of thing you want to give it a try. Yeah. There, there's a possibility <laughs> they've Who come knows? out of the tombs and you don't know. Uh, but I wouldn't depend on next year's crop for those. Uh, you know, these aren't exactly ideal storage conditions <laughs> in an old barn. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we want to remind folks about a great event that's coming up. This is our annual spring bus tour and it's in Bayfield in Madeline Island. What we do is take a coach bus, we go out on the Bayfield Peninsula and uh, spend the day touring gardens, we have lunch, we just have a, a wonderful time. We, there are still some tickets available for that, so go to our website for more information to find out more about that. Also, there are some community ed classes coming up, and those are at uh, through Proctor Hermantown Community Ed. They're at the Grand Lake Community Center. The classes include uh, information about succulents, herbs, vegetable gardening from seed. There's the website, but it, as always, you can link from our website and find out more about that. You can also find out about the great extravaganza coming up. This Saturday, that's Tom's right. going to join us and Tom and, sustainable gardening. and our, our rock star Bob is going to be there. <laughs> Hardly. Uh, I made the front page of the paper today. You're, you guys are so famous. <laughs> we're, just, we're just having fun and yeah. we're, we're, we're looking forward to that because I'm looking to come and learn, looking at climate change and how that's really going to potentially impact gardening in northern Minnesota. So it should be should fun. Should be great information. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks so much. And tickets so much. are still available if folks There's still home. space. That's right. They no, walk into the door if they like. Space. Nine o'clock, Hermantown High School. I hope you have a great time there. All We're right, thanks fun, a lot, yeah. guys. That does it for this edition of Great Gardening. And as always, excellent right. advice and information. We really appreciate your time. And we want to throw some gratitude to the St. Louis County Master Gardeners for donating their time to answer the phones. And thank all of you who called in. Here's hoping that the... Uh, Spring weather continues in our area. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. From all of us here, thank you for watching and enjoy the garden.